storytelling. And we all know that storytelling, in the deepest sense of that phenomenon, is how cultures convey meaning, it's how peoples convey values, it's how societies form their young, it's how societies perdure in terms of their worldview and in terms of their outlook. So we can think of storytelling in the simplest of manners, fairy tales, or we can think of them in the most complicated of structures, the great myths of the various cultures and societies. Or we can think of them in the immediacy of a social moment, and that's what pop culture, excuse me, are we all down in order? <laughs> Don't turn the head, sorry. Good. So we have this afternoon, to my immediate left, John Granger, who is guest to our college. He comes to us all the way from the state of Oklahoma and is very well known for his work dealing with especially the Harry Potter series and now the Hunger Games series. And studying those popular novels with a view to their convergence of the social values, the religious values, and literary values. He's an author, a speaker, a professor, who currently really writes and lectures full time. He holds an honors degree from the University of Chicago. Do I have that right? Right. Where he studied and uh, studied classical language and literature. So he's a frequent speaker at academic conferences. He's also a frequent speaker, speaker at fan-based conferences. Harry Potter expert, according to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and CNN. So we are most delighted to have you with us, John. Next to John, going further to my left, is Art Remillard, who is a teacher of religious studies at St. Francis University. We all know where St. Francis is, don't we? It's our neighbor and our uh, friend, brother school, down, down the road, a piece. He's book review editor for the Journal of the Southern Religion, contributes to religion in American history blog. He's the author, and you're going to see a theme here, of two books, Southern Civil Religions, Imagining the Good Society in the Post-Reconstruction Era, and presently a book that is entitled God and Games in Dixieland, Religion and the Making of the South, modern sports world. So I'm wondering if you were born somewhere south of Loretta. No? A Pennsylvania born. Yes. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. And then our own Dr. Anthony Degani, who, as we know, teaches religious, religious studies here at Mount Aloysius College and frequently writes and lectures on topics related to spirituality and ecumenism. He's a popular teacher and presenter for the Theology on Tap series, which is sponsored by the Catholic Diocese of Altoona Johnstown. And in his free time, he enjoys reading, and this is a new discovery for me, and writing fantasy literature. So we have two authors and several professors. I'm going to ask each of them to speak just for two or three minutes to kind of set the tone of what it is they're bringing to the conversation this afternoon. Then we're hoping to get a conversation going among them, and then we're going to open the circle so the conversation can extend to yourself. So I'll ask if um, Art would begin. Sure. Thank you. I have prepared one. Good. And I want to start with uh, the amygdala. Uh, this is the part of the brain that's responsible for or more primal emotions, and what I want to focus on is, is fear. Make the noise here. See if that works. Okay. Uh, so the one I want to focus on is fear. Uh, so this is located in the temporal lobe, and it's sort of your early warning system. So when something in your environment uh, comes about uh, and poses a danger, say a stick breaking in a lonely dark woods, your amygdala kicks into high alert, and this sends pulses of adrenaline and other things into you so that you can prepare for the very worst. This is a very potent mechanism in your brain that once it engages, it's really kind of hard to disengage. 
this is this is this is a survival mechanism that we all have. Now I'm sharing this piece of neurological trivia, not because I want to impress the medical professionals in the room, which I kind of do, <laughs> uh, but rather because it helps me make sense of the popularity of apocalypticism in American life and culture. For the purpose of this talk, I want to use the, the term apocalypticism to refer to these imagined futures where life as we know it no longer exists, where there is a imbalance between justice and injustice, and where there is a striving towards some rebalancing of those two polarities. Uh, but nothing seems to capture our amygdala collectively than stories of an end time. In the Christian tradition, in America, for example, we might think of somebody by the name of William Miller, who was a farmer in New York, who in the 1830s theorized that the number codes in the book of Daniel uh, foretold of the Lord's return on March 21st, 1843. Uh, well, this was a very popular message. Between 30,000 and 100,000 people came and started following him, listening to what he had to say. But then that day came and it went. And he went back to the book of Daniel and he looked at his numbers and he said, oh, I forgot to carry the one. And he said, oh, no, it's, it's actually October 22nd, 1844. Everyone said, oh, okay, great. Was... But that didn't work out. Uh, now, it didn't work out, but the popularity of this is, is in some ways telling, and, it, and it's still telling. Uh, not that long ago, we had Harold Camping uh, gain national attention when he said that October 21st, 2011, was going to be the end date of human history. But in the words of Rick Perry, oops. <laughs> um, so we have figures like Miller, like Camping, and many others who give us these sort of literal end dates. But fiction gives us a more vicarious experience of the fear of life as we know it coming to an end. Uh, so today we're talking about that popular novel, The Hunger Games. And no doubt, in my mind, part of the appeal of this book is its ability to incite that sense of fear that we have about the end coming. Um, and what I want to suggest today, in addition to that, is that it, this can tell us a lot about our current condition. Not only what fears are engendered by reading this book in itself, but what fears do we have about the world we live in today? So what I want to do is a, just a brief comparison and look back over, around the decade first to another sort of apocalyptic narrative. 1999, Keanu Reeves gave us uh, the, the, the film star Neo in The Matrix. Many of you, I hope, have seen The Matrix. Now, like The Hunger Games, this film has an imagined future where humans are held captive by some malevolent force. Um, and moreover, we have a reluctant hero in the person of Neo with untold physical and mental gifts uh, who reluctantly brings those about for the liberation of people held in bondage. The difference in these two stories, though, tells us quite a bit about the times we live in. In The Matrix, humans were authors of their own undoing because they had advanced too rapidly. The creation, specifically, of artificial intelligence, says the story, led to the state where machines overtook humanity. And now humanity had to fight back. Now compare this with the Hunger Games. Because in the Hunger Games, the humans are authors of their own undoing. However, instead of technology as the catalyst, it is human greed. Uh, in the first book, that we, we learn that the great empire of America came crumbling down as a result of the evil ambitions of people who neglected the environment and society and everything else. So when Silicon Valley is churning away in the 1990s, credit default swaps are allowing us uh, to party like it's 1929, right? The, the matrix tapped into these primal fears that we have about inverting the promises of technology. The promise of technology says your life will get better through technology, through development, through advancement. And what the Matrix did is it came along and it flipped that equation and said, oh, actually, you are going to oppress yourselves through your own inventions. Um, now, in the wake of the Great Recession, Bernie Madoff and corporate greed, our amygdalas are tuned in to darker forces within 
the human self uh, in general. And specifically, we think about blind spots more. What are the blind spots that we have uh, that, that, that allow us to seek short-term gain rather than thinking about the common good? Um, so I suppose that's where I want to sort of leave my reflection and, and to echo what Sister Helen said. Um, what do stories about the end times tell us about who we were, who we are, and who we hope to be? Um, are these fears legitimate? Are we draining our energies thinking about these things? Or are these things that we need to be reminded of so that we progress or we act in this world with a sort of healthy degree of skepticism? In any case, I think the popular culture indeed is a great place to think about important questions about humanity. That's good. Good job. You want to follow that? Apocalyptic fear, greed. <laughs> first, first, I want to tell the story in that what a uh, marvelous thing it is to be sitting here next to Professor Harvard Lord, and that we were just reminiscing over here. We met 20 years ago in Okinawa, Japan, when we were both scrawny, uh, young, you uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot skinnier then, believe it or not, uh, and. He would go to my house because my wife cooked great food and, and made him lighter and faster. Uh, and we ran miles and miles together. And believe it or not, we didn't talk about apocalyptic literature at once, I think. There's thousands of them. Uh, 20 years later, here we are talking to you all. All right. Uh, I guess I'll start in response and then talk about what I talk about, which is one of the things that, that Art talked about was uh, the meaning of these books is transparency. It's how we experience them, it's things we fear. We're looking through the story like it's a window to see something in our own lives that we're concerned about. Uh, that these so-called future worlds are actually the worlds we're living in now and our present concerns. Uh, and that, I think, gets to the point of what we're talking about today in general. We are talking about the Hunger Games specifically. I, I want to broaden it out before Dr. Bugatti brings us all back together here. We start to mud wrestle or whatever we're doing here. Uh, in that, my first, the reason I, I entered this conversation was I had to figure out why the Harry Potter books were so popular. And that question was not being answered, I thought, in an intelligent fashion. Uh, it was answered, it, it, it was, it's demonic influence, oh, it's uh, marketing. But this was a phenomenon that was taking over the popular imagination and none of those answers really made a lot of sense. If it were marketing, then every book would be that popular because there would be a marketing formula to make Polymania out of every book. And that wasn't happening. And so I began to read and study these things. And one, one of the, the most satisfying answers that I found uh, is from a man named Mercy Iliadi, who said that in a secular culture, uh, really when God has been driven to the periphery of the public square, like the culture we live in now, that reading, all popular entertainment, but especially reading, will serve a mythic or a religious function. That designed as we are, I mean, Iliadi calls this homo religiosus, we are created to long for some sort of transcendent experience. Some experience greater than our ego selves, our, our, our mask, our persona, you know, this, this restricted idea of ourselves as individuals, that, that delusion of individuality. We want an experience greater than that, an experience of something transcendent. And that books, especially novels, fictional novels, allow us to have an experience of something greater. Right? And Iliadi's point was, um, we can find that in reading because when we enter into the story, all of the individual dross falls off of us. And we're essentially uh, reading with what Coleridge called the primary imagination, what our Lord calls the heart, you know, the noetic faculty of soul. And when we read, we foster that spiritual faculty we have within us, that story. We enter into the transparency you're talking about, and all of us, to include these, these bizarre parts of our mind or whatever, are triggered by our experience inside this book. And we're transformed in that. My, my corollary to Iliadi's thesis is that those books, which will be the most popular ones, mm -hmm. are the ones that satisfy this longing for transcendent experience the most. So the, really the upside down answer as to why Harry Potter is so popular wasn't because it was demonic and it opened us up to you know, the gateway to the occult or whatever, but most interestingly to me, it was because of its 
Christian content and our being able to recognize our reflection inside the story, our heart can recognize its reflection inside the story that made us love it as much as we did. Because we were journeying along with Harry Potter, the spiritual heart, as in every, every single book, Harry dies and rises from the dead, like a faux death, whatever Harry says, so this is what it's like to die. Which he does in every single book, right? He, he does that, and by the fifth or sixth book, you can say, oh good, he's not going to die, because he says that in every book, right, before he gets out of it. Um, and he, he rises from the dead, in the first book after three days, um, in the presence of the symbol of Christ. And we have that spiritual resonance inside the story that we've experienced, again, as this transparency or translucency, and we're transformed by it. We're reading in order to get beyond ourselves, and those stories that allow us to make that passage most easily, those are the ones we like the most, because it's doing what books are supposed to do. Why we read. Now, popular literature, man, you're all the Harry Potter generation, they call you Generation X, um, that you have grown up largely in, a, in an imaginative landscape that has been defined by Harry Potter. The other large, Phrases that have happened since Harry Potter came out, most notably Twilight and Hunger Games, have largely been built on the same artistry and meaning that are in Harry Potter. Totally different genres. The dystopian one for Hunger Games and, and Harlequin romance for Twilight, as opposed to schoolboy novels and, and gothic stuff for Harry Potter. Totally different genres, but the same sort of artistry and meaning, which we can talk about some more after Dr. Negroni talks. And that gives us this transcendent experience. Here's, here's, here's the glitch, is that almost all of us have grown up in a world where we think of <laughs> our, our television viewing and our reading popular fiction as a place where we go just to get away from the world. Where it's, it's our entertainment, it's our dissipation, it's where we recover ourselves from our work and this and that. A man named Ralph Wood at Baylor talking about Tolkien says that uh, this is a, a big mistake, that really that we don't read books to uh, escape from reality. We read these sorts of books to enter into reality more fully in our hearts and through these references that we get through the stories. I mean, there's a reason, I know sister was talking about this earlier, there's a reason that story has its power and the reason that Jesus of Nazareth only speaks in story is that he's speaking to this capacity within us which is him, quite literally. And that will be transformed as much as we identify with that reading logos within us. Anyway, I'm, I'm talking too much. Um, I want to hear Dr. Negroni has to we'll say. We're going to take off from the logos and move us into another direction or the same place. Okay. Go ahead, Dr. Thank you. Uh, I want to build a bit on what John said regarding literature, this kind of literature not being about escape, but rather being about transcendence. Recently, somebody contacted me with a question. Um, he knows I'm into fantasy literature and also into faith. He asked me this. He said, I'm a really committed Christian. My faith is the center of my life. But I love to read. I love to write fantasy literature. People at my church are telling me this is wrong. That's promoting witchcraft. What should I do? He was really torn about this. He loved fantasy. He loved writing it. But people in his church were saying, this is wrong, it's magic, it's sorcery. And it brought to mind something that happened oh, about 10 years ago when I was living in Pittsburgh. There was a church there in the northern part of Pittsburgh that decided that Harry Potter was the work of the devil. And they decided to have a book burning. It made it all over the media, actually. People from all over the region came in with their Harry Potter books and had a big bonfire burning them. Now, the fact that this reminded people of Nazi Germany didn't seem to faze them at all. <laughs> they were determined to rid the world, or at least the greater Pittsburgh area, of Harry Potter and its witchery. <laughs> thinking about that, and thinking about the situation this guy's coming from, I thought about my own experience. The reason I'm sitting here today as a professor of religious studies and philosophy is because of the impact that this kind of popular literature had on me. No. When I was maybe uh, eight or nine, it was my birthday, a neighbor gave me a copy of The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Anyone ever read that book? Yes. Many of you. 
When I read it, it moved me, and it also struck me as being familiar. Even though I wasn't familiar with these stories, there's something about this magical world that spoke to something inside of me. I felt like I had been there before or had a connection of some kind. And I couldn't put my finger on what that was until later on I was reading a book by C.S. Lewis called Surprised by Joy. And in it he's talking about when he was a boy reading the Norse myths, reading the, the tales of the, uh, of the ring, and how it conjured up in him feelings of a world that he, he felt connected to in some way. He called that joy in his language. And that's exactly what I felt. Um, what I've learned since then is that this kind of literature, transcendent literature, really does a lot to speak to the human heart in ways that other literature can't, especially fantasy literature and uh, literature that taps into the apocalyptic imagination, because it conjures up archetypes, uh, mythological figures and images. It uses symbolism to reach the human heart, to really reach the subconscious mind. And by doing that, it makes us open to possibilities we wouldn't otherwise consider. So getting back to the original question, I'm a Christian, can I write fantasy? My response to him was yes. The magic in Harry Potter is not really witchcraft by any means. Um, rather, it's the stuff of dreams. In dreams, we can fly sometimes. In dreams, remarkable things happen. That's because the dreams are the unconscious mind speaking to us. Uh, the magic in Harry Potter is speaking directly to our unconscious mind, speaking to our dreams. And by writing this kind of literature, you can communicate profound truths that people will be open to, but otherwise they may never have ever considered or been close to from the beginning. And uh, finally, I just want to say that I think this really applies to the Hunger Games in many ways. When I was first told about this panel, I figured, gee, maybe I should read the Hunger Games. <laughs> I didn't really want to. You see, um, I never got into the whole Twilight thing. It struck me as being the new Twilight, the love triangle and all of that. But when I began reading The Hunger Games, I was so impressed by the depth of meaning in it. Uh, it's touching upon big issues. It's touching upon big ideas, and especially the importance of human choice and the choices that we make. And I'm glad I read it. I find it to be very profound. The only thing I didn't like about The Hunger Games originally was the love triangle. It felt to me like it was forced, like it was put there to kind of appeal to teenage readers. But by the time I finished the third book, it made sense to me. It became clear to me that the love triangle, not to spoil anything out there, but the love triangle is actually symbolic. It's symbolic of two choices that Katniss can make, a path of love and forgiveness or a path of vengeance and violence. Um, so yeah, The Hunger Games even spoke to me in ways I never imagined. So I think right there we can see the power of this kind of literature has. How, I'm going to go right in. Go right to them and say, how many of you have, have either read The Hunger Games or seen the first movie? Oh, okay. So we're not talking to ourselves. That's, 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 that's the speaker's nightmare or whatever. Um, well, sort of talking about what I'm talking about tomorrow as well. Is an an arm and, and, and cut me off. Right? I, I know you. Done before while we're running this. Um, what is the transparency? What is the mythic quality to this story of a girl in District 12 that decides to save her sister and then she winds up on a train and she has to go through this sort of obstacle course, murderous obstacle course, kill a bunch of people? And what's, what's mythic or redeeming or edifying about that story? Well, I mean, the, the, uh, the trio of Gail, who is described as being like her brother. They're so much alike. I um, mentioned they actually play the parts of cousins, really, in a drama for the capital people. Uh, and Peta, who is really off stage except for one moment in her life as a, as, a, as a young person, and then he appears again miraculously at the reap, uh, is, is simulated in another figure. But here's the mythic quality to it. And I think, as, as young people, you can probably get this, is that you know, Jennifer Lawrence plays this part for a reason. In, in the book, she's sort of like Tippy Longstocking. She doesn't really, you know, she's yeah. being this drop-dead figure. And then all of a sudden, you know, Jennifer Lawrence walks in and says, oh my goodness, 
This girl is going out into the woods with this buff young guy, and he never touches her. And then Peter is sleeping with her on the train, and also nothing ever happens there. This, you may recognize as myth. <laughs> this, this is not the sort of thing that you're going to see in your absolute you know, autobiographical accounts of what really happened to me. You, just, you begin to see that these figures, in some sense, must be allegorical. They must be, uh, they must represent something greater than just these characters as they are. And sure enough, as, when you get to the end of the series, and I'm not going to spoil too much for you, but what you find out really is, is that Katniss and Gale are a, are a snapshot of a human being, of one human being, their body and soul. Gale gets to be the body. And Katniss is the soul. She's the, she's the, uh, of that, of that twosome, she's the more spiritual and thoughtful one. He's the practical, grounded, I will provide, you know, masculine figure. And she's the more spiritual thing. She's also hard as nail, etc. But here we have the body and soul. When she, after reaping, says, I'm going to save my sister Primrose, which is no way like the white rose, which Brady is about the books, which brings back to Dante or whatever. I mean, when she chooses to die to save the primrose, she leaves the world. Is that my phone or somebody else's? It may be somebody else's. So. I, I love that. Should we all scare the person with the phone? I went to a play when I was, when I was a young person in New York called the, um, oh, what's it called? Hmm. Well, it was the longest running play in American history for the longest time, I think, until Cats. Anyway, the reason it was the longest running play in history was because it was a tiny little theater that only sat about half the size of this crowd or whatever. And whenever you walked in, it would interrupt the play. And so all the actors would stop and watch that person as they came in to sit down. I always wanted to do that with some of the cell phone goes off. Just stop and all just look at the cell <laughs> Anyway, where were we? Well, let's, let's get back, back on to, Back to the cell phone yes. goes off. No. The uh, Katniss is the soul, and when she decides, I am going to sacrifice my life for this sister who is my beloved, I'm in, in an act of sacrificial love, she throws herself in front of the train. All of a sudden, Peta appears again. Now, Peta has only appeared once in her life before when she was near death. She was starving, and Peter, at, at really, this doesn't come out in the movie. If you've only seen the movie, this isn't really very well done in the movie. Peta knows he's going to be beaten, and he gives the bread to Katniss. He burns it and then gives it to her. He doesn't just throw it in the slot. He intends, he, he comes out and only gives the bread to her, and it saves her. He later makes eye contact, she makes eye contact with him in school, and in the eye contact, she has a revelation about how she's going to provide for her whole family. Peter here is like Peta as in bread, and also as in Peter, you know, the rock of the faith. He's a symbol of Christ inside the thing. And when she makes this decision, she has no contact with Peter in that moment, mm -hmm. and then when she says, I'm going to throw my life on the, you know, the railroad tracks to save my sister, all of a sudden, Peter reappears again. And he is there only to save her. He's the spirit. He's the Christ figure of the story. And it's all about her choice, about whether I'm going to be with Gail, who is like justice, or if I'm going to be like Christ, which is mercy. And which one of these two aspects, the spiritual or the physical, the demands of the human person in the world, body and soul, or the unification of the soul and the spirit and her relationship with Peter. And this is an agonizing decision, especially as Peter becomes, so we seem to be something, something different in the last book. We see this agony. And as we identify with Katniss, as she tells the story, we identify with her, we experience this own struggle that we have every day in the choices that we make. It's a very powerful story. It's, wrong. it's a very powerful story from the viewpoint of the characters. But I go back to Art's input about the apocalyptic nature, because what does it tell us about society? What does it tell us about the community? What is the, the attraction in the social order, or what's the redemption, maybe, in the social order? Because you're saying apocalyptic does reverse, but if it's kind of a hopeful apocalyptic, 
the reverse shows us some kind of redemption. And do you get that from the Hunger Games? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think an apocalypse is about the search for justice, yeah. right? I mean, that's yeah. what Revelation mm -hmm. is. It's, 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 a, it's a story of, of, of an unjust world becoming just. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's what allows us to think about it. And to me, I guess I read things a little bit differently in terms of the, who Katniss was and, and what she represented and what she tells us about her current situation. And I go back to the Matrix. Who is the hero, the archetype hero of the Matrix? It's the young, white, male, uh, probably in his late 20s, early 30s, right? That's the hero that happened in the 1990s. That's the Silicon Valley startup, right? Who is the hero of our current era? A teenage female. And I think that the way I kind of read, you know, the, the, the you know, lack of any sort of sexual attraction and stuff like that was more the sense that in the future, gender equality is normative. Mm. And in the future, um, strength comes in masculine and feminine form. In the future, uh, Neo, you know, in, in the Matrix, is powerful with muscularity. You know, he can command weapons. He has all of the various martial arts. In the Hunger Games, you have somebody with a bow and arrow. I don't know if any of you hunt, but you can't hit anything beyond 30 meters with a bow and arrow. Um, but, you know, it, so I, I think that what it's telling us, you know, is that in our current time, in, in the way it's depicted, you don't feel as though this is made exceptional. When you read Katniss progressing through her hero's journey, right, this is Joseph Campbell plug and chug, the Hunger Games, I mean, it's just blatant. Um, but, you know, when, when you see Katniss going, going through this, is not made to seem exceptional. That we can envision a future where gender, uh, the genders are, are, are operating like this, where their strengths and weaknesses balance out and, and we aren't uh, kind of on a gender hierarchy. Uh, and I think that that's more imaginable in a world where we see female heads of state, where we have women in prominent uh, places uh, all, all across society, globally. Um, and Moreover, a global focus on, okay, what can we do to make sure that women uh, in the world who are not making the contributions that they could, um, what are we doing to make sure that they can? I mean, that's one of the, the, the major goals of the Millennial Development Goals is, is the empowerment of education of women. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that it, it resonates because that's such a big part of our conversation about what is a just world. A just world is a place with gender equality. Tony, you want to weigh in on some of this? Sure. Yes. I'd be interested in hearing the thoughts of you two on whether the Hunger Games ultimately pro provides a, a vision of hope or a vision of bleak despair. <laughs> and again, I don't want to give away the ending too much, but I think it's fair to say that at the end of the third book, not a lot of faith is shown in human government. Yes. I think on one hand it shows personal human beings, individuals, and his families, and small units um, can find goodness and can find love. But I think overall the vision is that humanity as a whole is, well, just driven to destroy each other. Well, I mean. I... <laughs> I'll scale back and then I'll come to what you're, what you're asking. I mean, to me, apocalyptic literature is largely a, uh, a shortcut to critiquing the world as, as we know it today. So 1984 was written in 1948, and Orwell was really talking about the post-war United Kingdom through this supposed 1984 far-off crazy world. Uh, and I think Hunger Games is the same way. She's talking about the capital as the evil place of snap. Well, the capital, you can think of it as Washington, D.C. if you're a Tea Party person, but um, I, I think the capital is actually more obviously the United States, and that she's writing as a Dorothy Day Catholic, saying basically that the entire world are these districts serving 
you know, basically the hedonists inside the United States and their little refuge in North America. Um, I mean, she's running, and, and if you read it from that perspective, it's a scathing critique of the American worldview and how we understand ourselves as, you know, being the, uh, the best and the brightest and we have this deserved place at the top of the mountain. Now, reading it that way, the, alle the allegory within this leaves you with a, uh, a more than scathing critique of government. I mean, there's, there's, there wind up being two competing governments in uh, the, the last book, Mockingjay. One is President Coyne, uh, as, a, as a woman, and she's from District 13, and she's leading the rebellion, sort of the Sparta rebellion against the hedonistic capital, which is headed by President Snow, a man. And both of these figures uh, don't meet a happy ending at, at the end of the books. I, 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 I can go that far without spoiling the whole thing. But what happens to Katniss? Again, this is a Dorothy Day piece. I don't know if many of you know about Dorothy Day, uh, uh, phenomenally important uh, American Catholic of the 20th century, uh, who was is primarily famous for her social work and her work as a pacifist. And these books are largely written as a critique of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, uh, Suzanne Collins is uh, the daughter of a career military officer and a Vietnam veteran who traveled the world with her father, went to every major battlefield, she said, in Europe, the Far East, and the United States. And he would lecture her on what happened at each one of these battlefields, not only in terms of the consequences of who won, who lost, but the consequences to the people that fought. And at the end of these books, uh, all, I'll tell you, I'll ruin this for you, all three of the principals survived. Gail, Peta, and Katniss survived, but they don't survive intact. They all survive as thoroughly broken individuals. Katniss and Peeta survive as phoenix figures. They, they quite literally become the girl and boy on fire. And th that phoenix imagery is Christian in that this is the resurrection bird. They totally die to themselves to basically say the state is evil because the state's priorities are not spiritual, are not mercy. It's all about justice and advantage. You know, Justice, when it becomes a human thing, is only about advantage and disadvantage. It's not about a divine idea of justice, which can be mercy. Um, well, but that in itself then is a well, it's a caricature <laughs> because uh, systems as well as people need to be just and can be just. And it would seem to me, at least in the Christian tradition, that at least for some theologies, redemption is not just about individuals coming to some kind of personal, no, especially it's about the world and the systems of the world arriving at some reconciliation which brings justice to the community. And I don't see that in The Hunger Games, nor do I see it in Harry Potter. I mean, because both of them, it seems to me, are very dualistic. In other words, they're setting, and it's the nature of allegory, I understand some of that, but it seems to me there there's something there to be learn about the way they split the good and the evil and the way they split the, you know, like the capital, which is all technology, is all evil. And, you know, District 12, which is pretty much an agricultural or even perhaps a more primitive, more of a woodsman's kind of, it is somewhat seen as, I don't say that it's seen as, uh, the desirable place, but it's a better place for human beings than the city. And that, to me, that doesn't bring us anywhere forward as a human community, but I don't know. You, you see my problem? Well, yeah, I, 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 I think I saw more the very realism at the end of The Hunger Games than I did a kind of Jordan Day pacifist mm -hmm. idealism. I mean, in other words, it wasn't a kind of counterintuitive resolution. If you saw um, a great arena, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you saw Grand Torino who had a counterintuitive resolution in the sense that you thought when he was going to go in and wipe things up, but instead it was this act of self-sacrifice. Right. Um, and, and, and the person who lived his life as, as, as understanding violence as the means for solving the problem finally kind of took that turn the other chief ethos and resolved the problem really. Good. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, you know, there's, there's an idealism in that, but, you know, I've, kind of, I've got a neighbor, you know, right old neighbor who said, you know, we live in a sinful world and we have to take imperfect measures to 
sort of just kind of keep things and, and <laughs> say, well, this, 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 this back to your point, I think, in a way that, that um, Dorothy Day pacifism was absolute. She just didn't believe in self-defense. I mean, she, she felt that the Nazis should have been allowed to have their way rather than fight the Second World War. Obviously not a very popular position, but one that she felt was consistent with the message of the gospel. So it's a, it's a radical position. Uh, Suzanne Collins, I think, is a, either a fallen Catholic or her coming back to her faith, argues that wars are necessary. That, I mean, there's no, there's no doubt in these books that, that capital has to be overthrown. So That's war true. is justified, and, and this is, but what means are allowed inside that war? And what happens to you when you enter that war is actually presented as a balance. Yes, wars are necessary, and wars will inevitably do this to all of the participants. They will bring them down to these, you know, these compromises. Um, and they will lower everyone necessarily, even if it's seemingly for this good. And that, I think, is Day's position, was no matter what you do in warfare, you are destroyed by it. You are being diminished by it. But then to Anthony's point, it's a pretty bleak view of what is possible for us as humans. If, except, except, I think, again, this resurrection. Give me the redemption. That, that, I mean, that, when she, uh, I, I, I'm going to tip the ending here, whatever. She winds up back in District 12, alive, but apart from the world. Entirely. She's really gone. It's almost like a theosis. She's become someone entirely separated from the world. And she and her beloved, I won't tell you who that was exactly, um, have children in the meadow, which is you know, the meadow song she sings to Rue inside, inside the Hunger Games in the first book, and that she mentions again repeatedly in the, in the attack on the Capitol at the end. The meadow is like the garden. She's coming back to the garden. But how does, the, how does the meadow take on its life again in the dead world? It's all the bodies of all those who have been in District 12 and is destroyed. So it's redemptive in the end, but everyone has, in a way, had to die to themselves and make these choices of sacrificial love to get to that point. Um, it's a heroin. Mockingjay, when I read Mockingjay, you're set up entirely. You read. You read Hunger Games and you read Catching Fire and you think, gosh, this, this is a fun, this is a, this is a really engaging story, isn't this neat? And then you get to Mockingjay, which is a nightmare, almost from the first, the, the opening where they're kicking skulls or whatever on this burnout town, to the very finish where they're in that same meadow. Um, it is exhausting. I felt, I, felt, it, you know, I felt wiped out for three days after reading Mockingjay. She set me up perfectly to be wiped out. Um, that experience was what we want in our literature to go back to this, because the artistry and meaning involved in that, how she uses the three characters as these, these faculties of soul that we have. Um, when she uses something called literary alchemy, about the stages of the books, you know, black stage or white stage or red stage, paralleling basically repentance, baptism, and theosis inside the traditional church's understanding of it. That, that's laid out the specific literary things from Shakespeare, Dickens on. And then the ring composition that she uses inside the books. So that the beginning and the end, not of the whole of each book, but the beginning and end of the whole series link up together. So we have chiasmus, like scriptural trick. These are, you know, the artistry and meaning that delivered this wow experience inside the book. Believe it or not, the same things are used in Twilight, and they both get them from Harry Potter. Because they, these women who wrote the books saw that it worked in Harry Potter, and they used them in different <coughs> genres to make to deliver this, again, this transcendent experience that we want in our reading. Let's have two more comments from Art and Tony, and then we're going to turn to you to so get your questions and your comments uh, ready, because we'd like to have those as we build on what's being said here. So Art, go ahead. Let's see if I can uh, kind of get to Tony's point about you know, what, 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 what is the takeaway. And if you read, and we're going to go back to Niebuhr, uh, if you read it, it can kind of be depressing. Because what he was doing, he was, he was really criticizing the, the, the kind of liberal theology of the early 20th century that was very idealistic. He said, we can transform structures, social gospel, you know, we can transform social structures, we can build a kingdom, a kingdom of heaven on earth and everything else. And it was very optimistic. And, and along comes the old doubter Bieber and, and, and to say, no, you know what, we live in a simple, broken world. Well, that's kind of that's kind of a bummer. 
<laughs> right? Um, but you know, my takeaway always from this is uh, when you kind of come into that and accept, and again, I think the end of the book, at least, I, you know, probably, I, I, no, probably, I did not read it as closely as you did. Um, <laughs> I mean, probably about it. Uh, at the end of the book, you know, you kind of have this, this sense that, oh, wow, the rising government could be just as bad as the previous one, right? Um, and you realize that you participate in sin. Whether you want to or not, you are participating in sin. And I think about when I sit down to eat, right? You put tomatoes on your salad, you know who's picking that? Slaves in Florida. I'm not saying like figurative, I'm saying literally Mexicans enslaved, put in chains, locked up, not paid, okay? 90% of our tomatoes come out of Florida. It's starting to get better. It's starting to get better, but we participate in that. When you have your turkey at Thanksgiving, everybody likes turkey, turkey's great, right? All kinds of toxic crap from Minnesota goes down into Louisiana, creates a dead zone. The entire state of Louisiana has a fishing industry eliminated, so we can have our turkey, right? Uh, you know, we participate in these structures of society, whether we want to or not, and they are simple structures. And what do we do? I'm well, sorry, not tomatoes. That's one thing. Yeah, you can, you can wallow in despair, or you can step back and have a little humility. Because it's a whole lot harder to stand up and say, I know everything. I'm right. I'm certain. Man, I, I'm, I'm the stuff. When you know that everything you're doing uh, is not the best thing you can do. And then you can step back and say, okay, you know, what can I do? In my own humble way, what can I do? So, I mean, to me, when I come to the end of it, you know, you're asking, asking that question. question. You're saying, what can I do to... Right. When you're dealing with political systems, you're going to have to deal with violence. You're going to have to deal with violence. Mm -hmm. and, and violence is sinful. I mean, I don't think there's any ambiguity when Jesus says, his last words, you know what Jesus' last words were to his, to his disciples? Not to last word period, but last word was the last thing he said? Put away your sword. He could have said all kinds of things. <laughs> What's up? You know, but no, put away your sword. Right? All right, Tony, we'll give you a, a last thing. We'll turn it over to the group. But yeah, uh, this whole idea of humans participating in a world where sin is around us and is kind of inescapable in many ways is true. And that does resound in the Hunger Games very strongly. I'm just one mind contrasting the end of the Hunger Games with, say, the end of Lord of the Rings. Have you ever seen Lord of the Rings films or read the books? Anyone? At the end of Lord of the Rings, uh, the long forgotten king returns. Aragorn returns. The tree blossoms again. We know that there's going to be justice. We know there's going to be goodness. We know that people are, for the most part, going to live happily ever after. Right? At the end of the Hunger Games. Aslan and Darnia At the end of the. Hunger Games, there's no sense in that. There's no sense that things are going to get any better for humanity. Maybe a little bit better, because that really, really bad guy Snow is dead. But other kind of bad guys are there now. And this gets back to what you were saying, <coughs> Sister Helen, about like, the call of Christianity to build a just society. Just how hard that really is. Um, I don't believe it's impossible by any means. But at the same time, I believe it's slow process that requires a great deal more patience than we as human beings have. And to kind of wrap that up, I want to just draw this into the current events. Those who know me know I don't like talking about politics. I want to stay out of politics because these people upset one way or the other. <laughs> but I will say this. Um, we've been through a rough economic time as a country, right? Four years ago, when President Obama was running, I think people have unrealistic expectations of what you can accomplish. Um, no matter how intelligent you are, even if you're the best politician, the best professor there is, there's no way you can turn around everything in our country instantaneously. And I think four years ago when I saw this, it kind of bothered me that people were expecting Messiah to come because the world just doesn't work that way. Um, there's no 
human messiah among us right now who can change things over time. I think that's good. And going back to what you were saying, Art, one of the more contemporary theologians in the Roman Catholic, John Sabrino, says quite clearly, we live in a suffering world. He doesn't talk about a sinful world, a suffering world. And the only way forward is that we work with mercy and justice. So mercy allows us as individuals to respect one another and to find our own best self. But justice is equally important because it allows the society in which we live to strive in the same way. So he challenges that you cannot separate, you cannot do one or the other, it's both in. And I think that's what I would have liked to have seen. And you're right, we were set up in the last, in the last book. Let's stop it. I, I'm, I'm uh, chomping the bit here because the ending, I just warn you, is actually better than this. In a way, the, the first thing that comes, I can tell you who becomes the head of Panem at the end of the Hunger Games is a, a woman named Commander Pale Or. Uh, and her name has been interpreted as Pale Or as either gold or silver. Now, that's, that's important in terms of the books. It can also be Pale Or because throughout the books, Peta's relationship with Katniss is about the pearl, which Collins uses as, obviously, the pearl of great price, which is the reason gold and pearls are considered as valuable as they are is because they're solid light. They're manifestations of the light of the world that you can hold in your hand. And so when Commander Paylor is becomes the head of Panem after the elimination of this, this polarity, of coin and snow, there's a promise somehow that, that something better has come at the end because there's a light at the top of the thing. And she's the one that allows Katniss to meet snow inside the sanctuary of sanctuaries. And she gets the white rose from him and the revelation of, that, that she's trusted in sons and princes of men. It's, it's a remarkably intricate ending that unfortunately every reader that gets to it is emotionally exhausted by the time they get there. Um, it, needs, it bears you know, repeated rereadings to see with, with care she laid that whole scene out. So there is promise at the end of the book. She's largely removed from it because in her sacrificial choice, she's removed herself really from the world. Um, just to call them becomes the, like a heaven on to me. But anyway, forget it. All right, now I'm sure all of you, when you read the book, were equally engaged in the symbolic and the literary and the... Uh, the uh, religious symbolism. What questions do you have or comments or further explorations that you'd like to? Any of the panelists or all of them in general? Yes, thank you. Uh, Kim? Christian souls. 
And he wasn't saying that everybody in the world you know, confesses Jesus of Nazareth as Savior. He was saying that the human being as designed has a, has a heart, has a, has a faculty of soul, which is, as, as Lewis said about conscious, is continuous with, or even identical with, the fabric of reality. And so when we get up in the morning, yeah, we want to do good, largely because this, this heart faculty within us wants to take on virtue, which are simply qualities of Christ. Right? We long for the true and the good and the beautiful, and obviously we want the true to overcome the, the false, we have the light over the darkness, etc. Because we have this within us as part of our makeup. And these stories, which are essentially parables, um, these parables of love's victory over death, which should be the subtitle to almost every year follow you know, love wins again, you know, death takes a, takes a downer there. I mean, that is what the heart longs for. We get the Mormon version of that, the Latter-day Saint version of that at Twilight. And we get, uh, I mean, a, a Catholic version, a very liberal um, and politicized Catholicism, if you forgive me, in, in the Hunger Games. But we're getting still this longing of the heart for justice and mercy and the problems of individuals and communities to find that. Uh, and that's what we want in our stories. We want that kind of depth of meaning. It tells me what it means to be human. We want answers to big questions. And here they are delivered not as dogmatic, didactic, uh, you know, answers to questions, Q&A, but as experiences we enter into imaginative. It's the difference between reading about France and going there, right? And so you, you, you ever always want the good, the true, and the beautiful? But when we enter into it in story and we see it happen, somehow we enter into that and are transformed. Uh, and that's a great aid to faith in a world that denies Christ, to actually have this experience again. Good, thank you, Annette. Yeah. Antoinette. Uh, I have a two-part question if I may, Sister Lyman. Sure. The first one is to the entire panel. And with regards to social order, if we look historically, of course, this is, is definitely a reader's digest version. Albeit, when we look at historically of supply and demand with the consumer and marketing, of films and literature. Let's go back to the 1940s comics and 50s. Who was that target audience? Young Matt, Flash Gordon, Batman, and so forth. Fast forward, we had Clark Gables, the, the older male distinguished. And then, you know, continuing throughout history until we got to the young male hero that's identified I think it was by you, with the Matrix. And now we're at a place where it's teen females, which I have a whole lot of thought about that with media, images of what is beauty. Mm -hmm. The initiated woman, and now she comes in teen form. Um, but can you speak to that with regards to the, is it your thoughts, is it a reciprocal relationship between the supply and demand consumer and the marketer, or do you think it has nothing to do with it at all? It's a funny story about the, 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 the movie as opposed to the book. So um, I, I hunt, which means I stay in a, in a, in a uh, tree stand and don't do anything. I take my rights <laughs> for a walk. And so my, my uh, father-in-law uh, brought me down to South Carolina to pig hunt, which was just giving my gun a long ride. <laughs> um, and I said, anyway, right before I left, he said, hey, if you write these Hunger Games books, no. So I'm checking out Walmart. It was $5. I thought, OK, I'll give this a shot. Look military. I thought it was Navy SEALs. <laughs> right? So I mean, hey, you know, this would be great. But I'm reading the book, and I just seen Winter's Bone, which I don't know if you saw that, but that was Jennifer Lawrence. That was, that was uh, I, I, I think it was Oscar nominated. Right? And um, she was not the print duck Barbie superhero, whatever, right? She was a gritty 16-year-old caught in the middle of meth cooking uh, Missouri, and it was it was a it was just a dirty movie, right? And and she was this this sort of and, and anyway, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, oh, that's her, right? That image, but then I didn't see the movie, but from what I've seen of the movie, they mm -hmm. glammed her up quite a bit. So I think that the intent of the author, I feel like, 
intent of the author, again, is to kind of get this normative claim about gender equality. And, and, and really, I didn't see in the book any hints of, of, of that kind of, you know, model-type hero. I saw in the, in, in, in the novel just, you know, if, if I am a young woman, I see myself through her, and I think that's why they are so appealing to young women. I don't know. Yes, I wasn't thinking of the glam version. That's why I said the emaciated well, woman. Emaciated. Almost like really, you the know, We had that one period of time in, in the media where uh, the thin female who appeared almost like a heroin addict was epitomized as mm -hmm. pretty. Interesting as beauty. Yeah. Yeah. But that, uh, what's interesting to note here is that Bella, Katniss, and Harry Potter uh, symbolically play the same role in terms of these trios. I mean, they're the heart, they're the spiritual character. And Harry Potter, though he's obviously a boy, you know, has, has his girlfriend Ginny and this and that, in terms of uh, the literature, he's a gothic heroine. He plays the part of the person who's always just enduring, just running away from the bad guys and persevering until the end. Right? All the gothic elements inside the story, Harry, the lit geeks, call him a gothic heroine. Because he has this relatively feminine and passive posture to his thing. Now he, he's obviously very active and enduring and this and that, but that's his posture. Well, these, the spirit has that relatively passive quality as well. Right? It's a matter of openness, receptivity, and pursuit, but not pursuit like in hunting down the weapon or whatever. It's a matter of just being consistent. And that's a relatively feminine characteristic. And so we see in these three characters, well, in two out of the three, the woman author has chosen to write this character as a woman. And in all three, remember these books are all written by women. All right? We're seeing the spirit represented as a woman or a feminine character because largely, especially in the West, in the United States, spirituality is seen as a feminine endeavor. I mean, if you go to most you know, Catholic and Protestant churches today, you'll see a disproportionate number of women in the pews compared to men. It's a little different among you Orthodox, a lot of bearded guys in the choir. But um, still, you see the feminization of spirituality in American life, where we understand spirituality as a feminine experience. And these three characters, I think, are women because that's how we, it resonates with us that this character would be like that. Did either of Mark or Tony want to say anything to that? <laughs> All right. It's a two-part like, question. If, yes, what was the second part? The second part question is more directed to Dr. Bergami. Regarding when you said earlier, oh, you get a break on this one, about, and please note that my question isn't adversarial, it's just more challenging for our, all of our personal and professional growth and development, that it's okay for Christians to do fantasy writing. And I'm just curious, what are your thoughts if that fantasy writing um, takes them to a place that doesn't bear good fruits? Yeah. It, with any kind of writing, it's possible to go in a dark, destructive place. Um, I think what it comes down to is, why are you doing it? Are you doing this for entertainment? Are you doing this to express the greater truth? Or are you writing a fantasy book with the uh, how-to guide to worship Satan? Right? I mean, I think if you're writing a book and you're including in it um, dark things that aren't healthy, and you're advocating that, that's one thing. If you're using made-up words and using fantastical imagery, I think you're just tapping into the imagination of that. I, I, I want to break down on this one. There's a tradition in English literature. The English literature, first of all, until the Second World War, are books, poems, and plays written by Christians for other Christians for the greater life of Christ. English literature is as Christian as Tibetan literature is Buddhist. You just really can't get around it. It's what English literature is. And there's a tradition really from the 14th, 15th century on, in which people use tropes, symbols, whole uh, sets of images and symbols that, that explain the Christian journey. Right? And that tradition, if you're writing inside that tradition, and you understand the tradition, then it's a good thing. You know, what you're writing is a good thing. And if you're writing outside of it, this is sort of a, a wish fulfillment, you know, projection, I'm going to write a great book and be famous and it's going to be a nasty whatever, then it's just your individual 
expressions. And it's not just something that we're all going to enjoy getting into. And it won't be popular because it won't deliver this experience that we now expect from our imaginative literature. I mean, is that, I mean, again, if you're inside that tradition, if you're writing like George MacDonald and C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, you know, Joanne Rowling, Suzanne Collins, if you're writing inside that tradition, it, it may not be a message that you like, maybe one that you actually disagree with, but it will be challenging in, in some respects just because of the engagement, it will be edifying. Another question or comment, observation? Yes, thank you. McKinsey, is it? Yes, thank you. Thanks to Amy Four and the Hunger Games have relatively firm outcomes. Do you think that the outcome is speaking that this is what the problem is more relative or less relative to the population? Okay, unfortunately, McKenzie, I think if you could speak it again because the noise lost the question. Some of it. Yeah. Are they more or less relevant because they're so popular? Is that the question? I think, think, let me maybe restate your question. If these books, like 1984 and Hunger Games, end on a relatively helpful snow, you're, 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 you're shattered, does that make them more or less popular? Is that what you're saying? Just more or less relevant. Relevant? Relevant. Well, I'll tell you this. If, if Mockingjay had been written first, none of us would have read Catching Fire or the third book. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we are, we are so broken down. No one, no one said, I can't wait for the fourth book. I really hope she writes another. I mean, we are, we're broken. And this isn't even 1984. But that's because dystopian literature as a rule are critiques of the world we live in now. And largely, they're a slap in the face. They're meant to be a very sobering, even shattering experience. Um, when you get to the punch, I mean, nobody asked for a sequel in 1984. No one said, I wonder what happened to that guy. You know, I mean, right. you're, I mean, you're, you're right. At the end, no more rats in your face. You just can't handle that anymore, right? That's it. That experience did what it was supposed to do, and it's even the Hunger Games. It was longer and laid out, and the setup was, you know, more significant so that you really got that experience and it stunned you when you got to that third book. Um, that makes it, I think, more relevant, but not more popular. I, I can't imagine what they're going to do with Mock and Jay when they come to make the movie. We're talking already about making two movies, a la Harry Potter and, and Twilight breaking up the last book. Um, I don't see it happening because uh, the, it's, it's not the same experience. It's nothing that we're all going to you know, look forward to. People will walk out of the Mock and Jay film doing the, really? Yeah, that's what happened? Well, I think also, uh, go ahead, Barbara. Um, yeah. Thank it's you. Not a pop culture novel, but it's apocalyptic. I think that part of the party's approach. How does that fit? It, and not being pop culture is also apocalyptic. What is this comparison? I don't know about it. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Do you know the book? I know my wife is reading it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Not much help. My daughter has read it too, but it's not going to help us. Uh, but uh, but now that literature, though, is uh, you know not a new thing. It's not like it's 1984 now. Another thing from my reading on yeah. uh, He wrote No Country for Old Men, right? Oh, that's yeah. after. That was very dark as well. This is much, much darker. Well, I don't know how it could get much darker. Yeah. But, but I think, yes, back to McKinsey's point and to some of what we're saying here and to your point about English literature and about this whole writing within the tradition, I think part of the danger, and I will say it that way, because I think all mythical literature and all apocalyptic has power and energy. But I think part of the danger of something like the Twilight Zone or the Hunger Games is that the audience, for the most part, is disconnected from the religious symbolism, the kind of the religious meaning, and possibly even some of the philosophical uh, positiveness. So you get back then to this hopelessness. If you read the book from the point of hopelessness, you're just going to go deeper into hopelessness. If you read the book from a kind of Christian optimism, 
then there's a possibility you'll do what we did with it and make some good meaning out of it. But I think the search for meaning can't just, the literature can't bear it all. Because you must bring, I think, something to it. it it'd be, and then I get into your area of so its specialty. Because I think what happens in the absence of that is the danger of cult and the danger of, of this whole sense of, uh, of a kind of a pseudo type of world that people then begin to live in rather than imagine it. And that's, I think. I mean, C.S. Lewis talked about this. We talked yes. about McDonald's work and said that. Uh, McDonald's Vantaskis was his, the baptism of his imagination. He meant an imagination not as, you know, fancy, which is really actually a fallen human capacity, but um, imagination the way Coleridge described it. The primary imagination was what Coleridge described as really this divine faculty within us. And that in story, he thought his imagination was baptized. What Lewis worried about, quite rightly, was people who were unchurched, people who didn't live within a, a sacramental tradition, who would read these books, and that was the only tradition they knew. And I see this, I'm, I'm talking Harry Potter fandom all the time, and it's largely an unchurched community that's resistant to any kind of you know, spiritual meaning inside the books, until the last, last of us, you know, uh, such sort of a gospel transparency that it was hard to miss. But that uh, resistance, uh, like a large portion of America I don't know what percentage you want to give to it, has been largely immunized to any kind of traditional faith. But that's just clearly where people who can't think for themselves go, or you know, uh, you know, lambs that are just buried in the slaughter, you know, uh, slaves to a patriarchy, whatever, you've heard all these things, right? That, that non-thinking people are traditional Christians. And so I don't want to be a non-thinking person, so I'm not going to go there. But when I enter Harry Potter, <laughs> and I have this imaginative experience where I rise to the dead, I will do that again and again and again. I've, I've met people that have read these books 20 times. It's a 4,100 page book. And they've read again and again and again, and I think it's because they like the story rather than the experience that they're having. And you have to wonder, well, is the baptism of the imagination going to be enough? When will they finally be able to get rid of this immunization? And I don't know if there's an answer to that. I, um, there's only so much that entertainment can, can can take Well, and that's what I think, though, the, what I would say, the, the hope for someone like myself who believes deeply in religion and faith as a, a human uh, omnipotence for good life, would say that the very fact that they capture people's hearts <laughs> tells us we're not, as a human community, entirely beyond the possibility of conversion or deepening our understanding in the spiritual journey is still possible. So. Uh, I think we probably have, let's have one closing word, Tony, Art, and then John, and then we'll wrap up the afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I think the fact that this kind of literature is so popular is in fact a sign of hope. That people are craving something more in life. Especially the popularity of the uh, fantasy type books, the supernatural element. I think what it shows is that many of us have a sense there's a deeper spiritual dimension to the world. And at some level, we might connect with it. And I think by reading about things like wizards or vampires, even though they're archetypal creatures, the fact that they're supernatural taps into that desire within each and every one of us to know there's more to life than we can see and feel much. Good. Thank you. Art. You know, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, at the time of the American Revolution, I mean, just you know, it's a pop quiz, right? The time of the American Revolution, uh, the percentage of Americans that belonged to a church was 17. About 70 percent of Americans belonged to a church at the time of the American Revolution. 17 or 70? 17. Okay, so thank you. Uh, by about 1990, that was up to about 60 percent. And what happens is, is that churches figure out what they have to do when you have a spiritual marketplace to get people. And Pastor Dean's here, so she's heard my take on this before, right? Um, so, you know, just to kind of this, you know, uh, traditional mainline Protestant Catholic uh, denominations are hammered in numbers, um, and they have a choice in that. And that is, do they tap into, you know, uh, that, 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 that element that we all have uh, to seek enchantment, um, to, to, to think and feel through questions, uh, that we deal with the struggle with every day? 
or they keep going with the status quo. Mm -hmm. And I think that what Anthony said is absolutely right. That these books and the reception of these books tell us that the audience is there. Uh, it's just, are these institutions ready to step up and take their ancient wisdom and make it uh, known and available and something that people want to come back and do? And, and good. Anthony is, in large part, an answer to your question. And as he said in the beginning, he read these books and felt something come alive, a resonance between what was happening in this story, a memory in a way, of what he was about, which was, you know, some impetus to his faith. Um, which, again, go full circle, it brings us back to Iliadi. If we're looking in, inside these books, especially if we, if, if our church communities have become uh, oases or uh, prisons of devotionalism, which they think is some sort of empty, mechanical, historical faith doesn't answer my needs, and yet I still have this capacity for love and a, and a desire to transcend myself. I get that in my books, so this faculty is still alive, I'm still recognizing there's something greater than myself, and I want that transcendent experience. These books, in a way, are just a uh, a life support system in a way for the unchurched, I think, where they're largely keeping that that heart back in your mind, that part of the soul that's in every person, the light of the world that comes into every man. It keeps that alive and fosters in us this sense of a greater reality than ourselves. And as Art said, the challenge is, will will the traditional church community be it uh, I mean the reason I did the, the churches were at 17% at the time of the revolution was because of the radical reformation, where every man was his own church. Uh, that's right. I understand. And the, the congregations, per se, were there because the, the America was settled by the radical reformation, and we remained that country of individuals. Um, when will the church as the body of Christ begin to speak to persons, not individuals, which is a revolutionary thing, speak to persons and say, you only have your existence and your reality as a member of this greater body. Uh, that's what I think that the solution does again. This life support system that will allow the church eventually to speak to God. Thank you very much. Thank, let's thank our